Bacterial Metabolism When you took general biology, you undoubtedly learned about a process called cellular respiration. And the first part of that that you learned about that happens in all living cells is the ability to convert glucose to pyruvate. And that process is called glycolysis. It occurs in the cytoplasm of all cells. Every living thing can do this process. But in humans, we can convert glucose to pyruvate, we can convert lactose, a variety of other simple sugars. This one right here, mannitol, humans can't do that, but Staph aureus can. So you can use your orange highlighter. These are three sugars that we'll focus on for bacteria being able to metabolize. And there's a test that we'll look at called um, the TSI, or the Triple Sugar Iron Test. And that will also include um, sucrose. So maybe we could, well anyway, we'll just leave it like that. But there is a test called TSI. Triple sugar iron and that test looks to see if different gram-negative bacteria are capable of metabolizing lactose, glucose, and sucrose. Sucrose is a glucose connected together with a fructose so if they can't break those two apart then they're not positive for sucrose metabolism. These would all be classified generically as carbohydrates. So we'll be studying the ability of different bacteria to metabolize different kinds of sugars. And that process of glycolysis is converting glucose, lactose, mannitol, a variety of other sugars to pyruvate. Mannitol, like I said, is special in that only a few bacteria that we study and that are medically significant can convert it to pyruvate. One is Staph aureus. One is Enterococcus. And one is Enterobacter. So there's a test that we'll do in lab called the MSA, or mannitol salt auger test, and these three genre of bacteria are able to ferment mannitol to make a little bit of ATP. So they actually turn the petri plate um, a yellow color because of that positive result, and that will become important when you're trying to identify bacteria. Okay, so then after glycolysis comes the next process, fermentation. And fermentation is converting pyruvate into one of these um, four generic pro or four products. So lactic acid, ethanol or alcohol, 2,3-butanediol, which is another kind of alcohol, but that one is um, not something you would drink, and then mixed acids, meaning eh, they can kind of make a little bit of all of these things. And it depends on which enzymes the bacteria have, which of these they can do. So actually, I'm not going to use red right there. I'm going to use um, blue. A key point is um, enzymes So for example, lactobacillus makes enzymes that when pyruvate is fermented, it converts it into lactic acid.
Interestingly, lactobacillus is a bacteria that doesn't have an electron transport chain. It only is able to ferment. That's all it can do to make ATP. And its end product, being lactic acid, is very sour. Uh, we're also able to do this. So Homo sapiens. So we produce lactic acid when we don't have oxygen available for ATP production, and so does the bacteria lactobacillus. Ethanol is produced by Saccharomyces. Remember that stands for sugar fungus. Cerevisiae, beer. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That ferments pyruvate to ethanol, and that's where we're able to get wine, beer, and hard liquor. Interestingly, candida also does this. It's another kind of fungus, but instead of being used in the food industry, candida albicans can overgrow in our gut or um, in a yeast infection. And in fact, there have been reported cases of someone with such a bad candida infection in their intestines that they start to um, behave as if they are a little bit drunk. How clinically common this is, I, I doubt, but I have heard of it. Okay, so then 2,3-butanidiol um, is an alcohol that is produced by a particular bacteria called Enterobacter. Now, in the real world, this one doesn't have a whole lot of interesting application, but it does matter in the lab. When you are trying to figure out whether the unknown bacteria you have is Enterobacter or E. coli. So E. coli produces mixed acids, and Enterobacter produces a pure product of 2,3-butanidiol. These are really similar in other areas in lab, and so there will be a test you do called the MRVP test that can help you tell these two apart. We can use um, our black pen. Um, so we, there's a test called methyl red or MR. And then there's one called the Vogue's Proskauer or VP. And then if you put those two tests together, we call it the MRVP test in order to differentiate between E. coli and Enterobacter. Uh, also, I'm going to put and other medically significant bacteria. There's actually lots of bacteria that produce mixed products because they're more versatile, right? If you can give them pyruvate and they can produce a little bit of all of these things or a variety of different acids, then they're going to be uh, more versatile than, say, for example, Enterobacter, which is only able to ferment pyruvate into one end product. Okay, so uh, recap a little bit. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of all living things, and it is the process of converting glucose into pyruvate. Uh, bacteria are able to take a few other products and also, one way or another, get them converted to pyruvate. So that's the first pro process. And then pyruvate can be fermented into one of these variety of products, and most bacteria are able to ferment. Um, there are a couple bacteria that are not able to ferment uh, food, Pseudomonas aeruginosa supposedly is one of those, although I've heard clinically that they're even finding that that occasionally is able to ferment. Um, so most bacteria can ferment. And then uh, if oxygen or another uh, very strong electronegative element is available, pyruvate can also then um, enter the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle is the other name for it. Uh, and the reason it's called the citric acid cycle has to do with the recycling of a citric acid compound. So this is, the circle represents enzyme changed into enzyme, and en changed into enzyme, and, and so on in this repeating cycle. And then ATP, excuse me, ATP is produced a little bit, and also some carbon dioxide. 
So you can use a purple pen and uh, one a waste product from this would be carbon dioxide. So if the bacteria are doing this, then you might see um, gas production. in the test tube. So pyruvate can enter this, but do you see all these other arrows? What you can see also going on is that fats and proteins can be used to make ATP. So over here we'll use a blue pen and you can write protein next to amino acids that. So amino acids, can some of them can be converted into pyruvate, and some of them can be converted into um, middle products that then can go into the acetyl uh, or the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle. So for example, um, tryptophan is an amino acid, one of the 20, that can be converted into pyruvate. Now there's a test that you can do where you test for indole. And indole is a byproduct of tryptophan being converted into pyruvate. So this bacteria, if for example, if it was able to convert tryptophan to pyruvate, would test indole positive in the lab. And some bacteria are able to convert cysteine into a product that can then go into the Krebs cycle. So you can write cysteine here. And if that's the case, then sulfur is given off as a byproduct, and this bacteria would be sulfur positive. Then you can use your blue highlighter So some amino acids can be converted into acetyl-CoA or other products. Tryptophan can be converted straight into pyruvate. So the point is, is that you know, there are 20 different amino acids, and there are uh, different ways that those amino acids can be used to gather ATP for the cell. And what we're concerned about on this page is saying, OK, the bacteria that we're interested in lab, what are some tests that we run that are looking at these different amino acid me metabolic pathways? Fats can also be used to make ATP. I'm going to write that in a green pen. And when a triglyceride is broken down, it's broken down into a glycerol and then some fatty acid tails. And those have different places to go. Glycerol is converted into pyruvate. And fatty acids head straight into the Krebs cycle. The point is, is that bacteria, just like humans, can use a lot of different kinds of nutrients to make ATP. Okay, now, if bacteria are going to use amino acids to try and make ATP, they have to deaminate them. And that's what this line represents. They have to take the amine group, or the ammonia, off of it. We have to do this too, not just bacteria. So you have to deaminate an amino acid if you want to get ATP out of it. And what you're left with is a toxic byproduct called ammonia. Now in humans, ammonia is converted into urea in the liver. In bacteria, they can just... Um, just excrete it. But some bacteria, like Proteus, are actually able to take urea, which is, and use urea to make ATP again. So it's a very efficient process. Like in humans, urea is just a waste product. For Proteus, Urea is a food because it has an enzyme called urease. 
So it's able to use what would be a waste product, put it back into the Krebs cycle, get a little bit of ATP from it. Okay, now after the Krebs cycle, electrons from the amino acids or electrons from the fatty acids or electrons from the pyruvate, you know, the car originally what was the carbohydrates, electrons from the nutrients are then going to be passed down. So if you were going to say what goes on in the Krebs cycle, you could put electrons from the nutrients are collected. And then if you were going to say what goes on in the electron transport chain, right here, electrons and the energy from those electrons is used to make ATP. Okay, I'm going to take a break and then in the next video I'll finish this up.